Welcome and greetings in the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for being part of Yorkton Alliance Church. Although we're separated geographically, we aren't alone. In fact, all around the world, the church is gathered where hundreds and even thousands of people in various languages are praising uh, our Lord God. And so we can join them as we lift our voices in praise and worship to God as we together sing this song, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. John of Patmos gives us a glimpse of what this worship is going to be like in the new heavens and the new earth. Here's what he describes in Revelation chapter 4. Around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature is like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with a face like a human face and the fourth living creature like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and inside. Day and night, without ceasing, they say, Holy, 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 holy the Lord God, God the Almighty, Almighty who, who was and is and is, and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to the one who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall before the one who is seated on the throne and worship the one who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, You, you are worthy, worthy our, our Lord, Lord and God, God to, to receive glory and honor and power. For you, you created all things and by your will they existed and were, were created. created.
found this prayer recently. It's a prayer of trust and longing. And it was written particularly for this time that we're facing in COVID. And I'd like to share it with you. And the numbers rise faster than we can process that these are not numbers, but each of these is a person. And each of these is not only one, but an interplay of persons, family, friends, even enemies. And each blossom like a rose, blooming its red wound against the backdrop of a thousand stories. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. We know you are not the author of death, but you do know the grasp full well. We are not here to accuse, but to ask you would be our comfort in the midst of the losses trending around us and towards us. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For we shall surely die and are like water spilled on the ground which cannot be gathered up again. Yet you, O Trinity of love, you do not take away life, but you plan ways so that the banished one will not be cast out. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. And as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil, for you are with us. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. Comfort, please comfort your people. Each human being in this moment needs to sense your relentless embrace of affection that whispers, I am with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. Especially for those of us who cannot even celebrate the ones we have lost because we ourselves are among the banished. We cannot in community tell the stories and share the grief and the hope that arises out of belonging. Our hearts feel cast off and cast away. Our emotions are overwhelmed and our crying offered in solitude. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. In the midst of our sorrow, we give to you what we most cherish, our trust. You who are good and kind and present we give to you our sadness and our longing. Speak to us your presence in the deepest places of our souls. And may, like children, we moment by moment place our trust in you. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. How are you doing? Really, what are you desiring from God these days that, he would, that you would like him to do for you, for your family? for those that are friends. I invite you to lift those requests to the Lord. One request is for Scott and Char. Scott had uh, lens surgery, lens replacement in both of his eyes. And uh, the surgery went well. One of the uh, things is it's for some people, they don't uh, recover their sight right away. And that's the case for Scott. Uh, he's not able to see clearly yet. And that's a bit of a concern uh, that they had but the surgery overall went well. I got a text Thursday night uh, that uh, his vision is still and hasn't come back yet. And then this morning, uh, Friday morning, while we're recording this, again, his vision hasn't returned yet. So if you can be in prayer, especially for Scott and Char and that family, as they just continue down this journey that uh, Scott is on. There's lots of things to be thankful for, but this is one thing that uh, is a bit concerning for them. So please join me in prayer. Father, thank you for your ministry to us by your spirit. And I pray for that healing work that, uh, that you do, that, uh, that you're about, that that healing work would be taking place even now for Scott, that you would uh, take the surgery that he has uh, received and that you would bring sight back uh, for him and to him. And Lord, I pray for Ian Shar as they they wait uh, for this, that they could have a deep sense of your presence uh, and comfort in their lives and for their families. And Father, I thank you for, that's the ministry of your spirit. And that ministry often happens through the tangible uh, hands and feet and voice of, of the body of Christ. And so I pray, Father, that for each of us, as we walk through these days, as we face challenges, that we won't walk alone, 
We certainly are with you. And I pray that uh, also there would be others that would be able to come alongside and walk with us, even with the restrictions that uh, this um, virus is posing or uh, causing us. Lord, thank you that you're with us. Thank you for your love. Thank you for just the ways that you demonstrate uh, your presence, your help uh, in our lives. We are grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. Everything's falling apart, and it feels like I can't do anything about it. Hey guys, it's me again, Douglas. And today I wanted to talk to you guys about, you know, helping those in need. I wanted to talk to you about dealing with really big problems, right? Because it seems like the earth right now has lots of really, really big problems. You know, there's people who are sick and there's people who are in danger and there's all kinds of terrible stuff happening to the planet and there's just all kinds of bad stuff going on. It seems like that's all I ever hear about is people talking about bad stuff and really big bad stuff. There are so many people out there who need help. There's so many things that need doing and I'm just me. I'm just one little Douglas and the world has so many big problems. I wish I could just Give the whole world one big hug because there's so many hurting people. But I can't even, you know, wrap my arms around a watermelon, let alone the world. And so I've really been, you know, upset about this for a while. I, I, I've been, I've been really frustrated and, and angry and, and feeling like, like I'm worthless, like I can't do anything. But I think I know what I'm supposed to do. You know, instead of just going bananas, I decided I was going to sit down, I was going to pray, and I was going to read my Bible, and I was going to you know, talk to people that I respect and look up to and, and see what they think. And I wanted to share the stuff that I've been learning through this. And I, I would totally suggest that you do the same thing that I did, you know, the, the sit down and pray and read your Bible and talk to people that you look up to, ask for their advice. But I want to share the stuff that I've been learning in the hopes that maybe it'll help you too. And first of all, I think it's important for us to recognize that the problems in this world are super big and we cannot fix them all. Only God can fix the world's problems. We might have been the ones to mess it up, but it's only God who can fix it. But you can be a part of God's plan to make the world a better place. God wants to use you to help. You know, the Bible says that the church is like the body of Christ, right? All believers are a part of the body of Christ, and it's our job to share the good news of Jesus Christ, to share God's love with the whole world. You know, it's funny, because I learned the other day that, like, Muscles really don't do a whole lot. Yeah, most muscles, they can only do two things. They can squeeze and release, and that's it. But like, I can, you know, dance, and I can, I can walk, and I can run, and I can do all kinds of stuff. I can do a lot more than just squeeze and release. And that's because I got all kinds of muscles and bones and ligaments and all kinds of stuff working together to make something happen. I feel like a lot of people are looking at the big problems of the world and thinking, well, I can't do anything about the big problems, so I'm going to do nothing. And that's not good. You may not be able to do a whole lot, but the little bit that you can do, God can use to make big things happen. You know, like, I'm not super, I'm not like a doctor or anything like that, so I don't know all the different bones and all the different muscles and stuff like that, but I'm pretty sure that my pinky toe, I can wiggle my pinky toe. And wiggling my pinky toe doesn't do a whole lot. But I'm pretty sure that when I take a step, I'm wiggling that pinky toe. It might not seem like a whole lot, but it's part of the action of taking a step. It helps. And you may not have a whole lot. You may not be able to do a whole lot. And that's okay. Just do what you can and God will take care of the rest. And so if you are looking at all the problems in the world like I've been and you are just losing your mind going bananas, I want you to take a deep breath. <sighs> and I want you to realize that you can't fix all the world's problems. God can. You can't, but you can do something. There's all kinds of things that you can do. Like maybe you don't have a lot of money, and so you can't give a lot of money if you don't have a lot of money, but maybe you've got a little money, and you could give a little bit of that little money to someone in need, and God could take that and do big things with it. And maybe you don't have a lot of time, but you could take a little bit of the little bit of time that you do have and share God's love with someone with that little bit of time. Maybe there aren't many people that you know of that are struggling but maybe you know somebody who's struggling, 
Or maybe you know somebody who knows somebody who's struggling. You don't have to help a million people. You could help just one person. And you don't have to fix all their problems. You can just help with what you can help with. You don't have to change the world to change the world. Any good thing that you do, no matter how little it is, God can use to do big things. And I'm not saying don't try to do big things. Some people have done some really big, amazing, cool things, and that's awesome. And we should look up to them and try to imitate them. But you can't do everything yourself. But you can do something. And even the littlest, tiny baby toe can help move the body of Christ to help further the kingdom of God. So how can we do what Douglas is talking about in a practical way? Well, we're working on a care ministry, one where each of us can participate by sharing our gifts and talents and skills and uh, resources for helping others that are in need. We're developing it. We'll share more about that as uh, the time goes on. But in the meantime, you can just be thinking about what are some of your skills and talents and resources that you would be willing to contribute or have available that we could call on you to use uh, in ministry to others. In our district, we have a fund called Venture. And Venture is a specialized ministry to help those people, to come alongside of people that are in uh, specialized ministries, like working with our First Nations and church planting. And I just wanna share a video with you about the kingdom work that's being done as a result of, of our Venture Ministry Fund. It's a work that's being done in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. Hello, I'm Bernie Vandewall, and I want to introduce you to my friend and colleague, Kirby James, a pastor in Prince Albert. He shares his thanks for your support of the Venture Fund and his vision for reaching the First Nations people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. She is amazing like she was uh, all in on carrying her cross she she came uh, ev pretty well every sunday and you should you know since day one to today you'd be amazed at how much she's grown i mean she is uh, showing you uh, an example of a new believer maturing over the over the uh, years as to the point where I, have, I had asked her if she could be a part of our advisory committee because I know she's a, she's a Cree woman and she, she has showed that uh, uh, this is a, a true example of a new believer uh, uh, maturing in Christ. And she, lo she just loves the Christ. She even helps financially every month. Uh, and so I am so honored to know that she has this ability that this church has provided for her. The Venture Fund ultimately created a space where a disciple was made. Well, what good can come of that? Culturally relevant transformation that points people to Jesus. Yeah, I've been here for five years as a First Nation pastor. And uh, I learned so much since I've been here. Uh, I'm a native from British Columbia, and just to learn about Cree and Dene and uh, Métis cultures is amazing. Amazing people on here that love God. And uh, we're not done yet. Um, my dream is that uh, I'd like to, after the pandemic, is to fill this church up. And that, that's my passion, is to find new believers just to fill this church up so that we can continue. There's 17,000 people, First Nation people, here in Prince Albert. And um, probably about 60 or 70 percent of them are, are unsaved. So this is an opportunity to be able to um, bring these First Nations people to salvation. And I thank the ones that uh, came alongside us, uh, the churches that helped support us uh, um, to be able to survive each month to month. And I, I appreciate the support. Uh, I mean, it's, we still could use uh, more funding. Uh, it's just that uh, uh, we're, uh, we're just not there yet. We need more funding to be able to provide uh, the services that we need to reach our First Nation people here in Saskatchewan. And so that's my dream, is to be able to see that uh, we would be a church that is uh, fully developed and that uh, we can raise disciples from here. 
and so they can evangelize. Thank you. The work of the Venture Fund is, in part, to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to those people who don't live near our major highways. Join us in this. And designate your gifts to the Venture Fund. Join us in prayerful support and encouragement of pastors like Kirby and the disciples that they work with. As I mentioned in the, the Thursday email, that in 2016, Jan and I took a, a six-week journey. It's actually a sabbatical that I was on. And we traveled from where we were living in New Hampshire, clear across the country to uh, the west coast of Vancouver Island, down into Northern California, through Utah, uh, Colorado, and, and back to uh, New Hampshire. It was a journey of over 14,000 uh, kilometers. And one of the things I think that made the journey uh, particularly enjoyable was the prior planning that we went, uh, that we did in preparation for that journey. It wasn't uh, planned out to the very uh, minute, but there was enough planning that made the, uh, the journey a, uh, not only a success, but uh, actually quite enjoyable. Even though it took a fair amount of planning, it really did make for a smooth journey. And so prior planning, whether it's for a long journey or, or a shorter duration, provides a pathway in which we can follow, and that allows us to make adjustments along the way and also to enjoy some surprises. But planning is an important part. And so this morning, I'm inviting you on a journey. It's one in which some prior planning will help make the journey a little bit more meaningful, I believe. The journey is a journey of, of the practice of Lent. Lent is an opportunity for us to experience God, God's love. It helps us to refocus our vision on who we are as beloved children of God. And it also is an opportunity to deepen our relationship with God. Now you may be saying, well, hold on here. What in the world does Lent have to do with us as Protestants? Isn't that just a Roman Catholic thing? Well, that's pretty much the way I viewed it for a number of years, but that changed. I grew up actually in a small town of less than 10,000 people, and there are probably at least 25 to 30 or more percent of those people were Roman Catholics. There was a Catholic elementary school in town. I went up to, uh, to grade eight, but the influence of the Catholics also were felt in the uh, public elementary schools, because there are a number of Catholics that were attending the, uh, the elementary schools. And one of the examples of how that was uh, felt was that we always had what was called meatless Fridays. We only could have fish on Fridays. And everybody knew, all the students knew, that that was because of the Roman Catholics and their practice. Now, there were other practices that uh, were done that, uh, and what we seemed to do was just lump them all together and then just simply dismiss them as saying, well, that's just, that's just the Catholics. Some examples of that are the statues of Jesus and Mary that were in lawns, the making of the sign of the cross, hanging up crucifixes, all the kneeling and rote uh, responses that they gave in masses, and even the putting uh, ashes on their foreheads and giving up sweets during Lent. And so the easiest way for us as Protestants to deal with these weird practices was to lump them together and then di simply dismiss them as being Catholic and just be done with it. And that certainly went for the practices surrounding Lent. Well, I learned some things over the years and things that took me beyond just being uh, this Protestant subculture, because even within the Protestant circles, there's hundreds, if not thousands of varieties. But one of the things that I learned is that Lent is bigger and much older than Roman Catholicism. It's much bigger in that it's observed by the Orthodox, which can also be considered Catholic, but it's by uh, Anglicans and Lutherans and Methodists, 
and the Evangelical Covenant denomination and the Charismatic Episcopal Church denomination and even some others practice Lent. And the other thing is that Lent preceded Roman Catholicism by almost a thousand years. Now that's inconvenient. It's inconvenient to learn something new because either I'm going to have to entrench and double down on what I believe and think, or I'm going to have to change my thinking. And that's what I've done over the years. If we look at the history, at the very beginning, in the earliest days of the church, there's been evidence that there has been some kind of preparation in Lent for Easter. St. Uh, Irenaeus discussed way back in the, this, well, it'll be the third century, the, the fact that uh, fasting was connected to Lent. And the discussion was, well, how long should that fast be? Eusebius, in his History of the Church, writes that in the times of our forefathers, and what he was saying there, forefathers, he's referring to the apostles, and so in the times of the apostles, he, he notes, there existed some kind of Lenten observance. Now, there, the actual practices and how it was done varied uh, for a number of centuries, but what is, can be concluded is that from the, at least by the end of the fourth century, there was a 40-day period that was done of a Lenten practice in preparation for Easter. And the primary f disciplines that were done uh, in that practice was prayer and fasting and almsgiving. And so it became a 40-day uh, period set aside in preparation for Easter. Now, how did they come about with 40, 40 for 40 days? Um, not sure, but if you think about the scriptures, there are a number of 40s that uh, pop up in the scripture. The nation of Israel was in the wilderness for 40 years. Moses spent 40 days on Mount Sinai getting the Ten Commandments. Elijah walked for 40 days and 40 nights to get to Mount Horeb. Jesus was in the wilderness. He was tested for 40 days. And so that's the number that they've come up with. Now the question can be, well, so what? What does that have to do with being a Christ follower in 2021? And I believe it, it's this, that we can enter into the spirit of Lent by engaging it as an opportunity for our intentional spiritual formation. Robert Weber, who is a, uh, well, he passed away a couple years ago, but he's a Protestant. He uh, taught for a number of years at Wheaton College and then um, down the road uh, in Lombard at North, uh, uh, Northern Baptist Seminary. And so here he is, this Protestant, and not only was he Protestant, but he had deep roots as a Baptist. And here's what he writes about Lent. He says this, Lent is the season of reflection, and it calls us back to God, back to basics, back to the spiritual realities of life. It calls on us to put to death the sin and the indifference we have in our hearts toward God and our fellow persons. And it beckons us to enter once again into the joy of the Lord, the joy of new life born out of death to the old life. And so for those that observe Lent, it begins on Ash Wednesday with the imposition of ashes on the forehead. And that is symbolizing the fact that it's from death that we were created and it will, will be to death that we return. Lent ends on uh, the Saturday of, uh, of Holy Week, the day before the Resurrection Day, Easter. So for those of you who got your calendar out and are looking at this, you'll notice that there's actually 46 days between Ash Wednesday on February 17th and, and uh, uh, Holy Saturday. And that's because Sundays don't count in figuring out that number. So it's 40 days and six Sundays, making up 46 uh, days. But the purpose is what's important here. The purpose of Lent 
is an intentional opportunity for serious reflection and, and evaluation of our lives for the purpose of identifying the bondages to sin that we are uh, in and to begin to then take steps to experience the freedom, the freedom that is ours already in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. But the reality is that we get into ruts in our lives. And so Lent is this set-aside opportunity to get out of the ruts and begin to form new ways and more healthful ways of living. And since it's a practical application to what Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, he, it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. One uh, author, David uh, Bentley Hart, who uh, his training was in the classics, in other words, he's an expert in uh, Latin and uh, Greek, he made a translation of the, uh, the New Testament from Greek uh, to English. And I like the way that he puts this verse. He, he translates it this way. Do not be configured to this age, but be transformed by the renewal of the intellect so that you may test the will of God, which is good and acceptable and perfect. And so our minds need to be transformed, or they need to be reconfigured. And now we know with the advances of science, we know that this is an actual process that takes place in our brain. Our experiences create neural pathways in our brain, and these pathways regulate our behavior. And some of that behavior is good, and there's other behaviors that are unhealthy and even destructive. And so in the transforming or the reconfiguring of our, our minds, we are actually establishing new neural pathways. And the idea there is so that we can bring our way of being, the way that we act, the way that we hate, behave, that we can bring the way of our being into the truth of our being. And the truth of our being is that we are beloved children that are redeemed by Christ. That's our identity as Christians, as new creations. But again, the reality is that we don't always act in a way that reflects our being new creatures in Christ. And so we need to get out of the rut, or out of a rut. And a rut is any unhealthy way of thinking or living which hinders our being fully awake and fully alive and fully free in Christ. And what is important here is it takes our participation along with the work of the Holy Spirit for this to happen. And so establishing new pathways, new, new, new neural, neural pathways, is to disarm the unhealthy pathways that uh, we are experiencing. And the thing is that once these new pathways are in place, they go a long way in helping us to maintain the kinds of behavior that is pleasing to the Lord. Ruts or neural pathways that are established in our minds are powerful. There's a... Uh, Example of this, actually on uh, YouTube, it uh, deals with a guy who uh, was challenged to ride a backwards bike. And the bike was configured in a way that when you turn the handle of the bike to the left, the tire, the front tire, goes to the, to the right, and vice versa. If you turn the handlebars to the right, the front tire goes to the left. And the challenge that he was given was, okay, ride this bike. And so in his mind, he knew what to do. He knew that you just have to make this adjustment and you get on the bike and you ride it. Well, and in fact, it took him eight months of practice to be able to ride this bike 50 meters. He, he worked on it just a few minutes every day, but it took him eight months. Well, he gave this challenge then to a friend of his, gave him this, the, the, configured the bike the same way, 
and said, okay, you try it, see how long it's gonna take you. Well, he worked on it a whole lot more, hours a day on it, but it still took him over three days or four days to actually to be able to ride this bike 50 meters. Hey Mike, it's me Destin from Smarter Every Day. I have a challenge for you. I love your channel. I love that you learn new skills every day. I think it's amazing, but I have a problem. I learned how to ride the backwards spring bicycle. You turn left and it goes right, vice versa. It took me eight months to do this, but I did it wrong. I just went to the end of the driveway and back once a day, and that took eight months. But I can no longer figure out how quickly I could have learned had I tried really hard. I know you didn't ask for this, but I've mailed you a bike made by the same welder, Barney, that made my bike. So if you don't mind, please, will you get me the data? <laughs> I know this is crazy, but how long will it take you to learn how to ride this thing for 50 meters without falling? Please wear a helmet. Thank you so much. So Destin said it took him eight months to learn how to ride this bike. Eight months, Destin, come on. How hard can it be? It's just a bike, right? So I'm going to try and concentrate that learning process into a much shorter space of time. So this is day one, hour zero. Oh God. Well, as you probably guessed, it's totally impossible. Right, you just ride backwards. Oh God. Well, that's a pretty quick way to break both your arms. Ah, oh, it's hopeless. I feel really stupid in front of these people because they can't see the gear, so it looks like I just can't ride a bike. This is so far away from a standard bicycle. It doesn't even feel like a bike. It just feels like I'm trying to learn an entirely new thing. What? Oh, oh, <laughs> yeah, right, lads. Those guys thought I was a 25 year old man who couldn't ride a bike. All right, this is day two. Oh. All right, that was my farthest ride yet. Oh. Getting somewhere. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. It's only day two, but. Definite progress. Look at this. F now. When you're leaning over and falling, your brain's screaming at you to steer this way to upright yourself, but you kind of have to consciously fight that. Yes, 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 yes. Yep, 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 getting it. Come on. Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Day three. And so creating, so breaking neural pathways takes effort. It doesn't come easily. But once they're established, they have a power, powerful effect in our lives. There are five spiritual disciplines that are associated with Lent. Fasting, prayer, scripture reading, almsgiving or generosity, and confession. And I consider each of these can serve as a means or a pathway for us to strengthen or establish neural pathways that can help us experience God and to adjust our lives in a way that uh, God has designed and desires for us. The key here is though, that, the, the, that these disciplines merely open up space. They position us in a place where the work of the Spirit can take place in transforming us and reconfiguring our minds. Now there are some unhealthful ways that we can approach spiritual disciplines or spiritual practices. One is simply to reduce these disciplines or any spiritual practice down to just an end in themselves. What I mean by that is simply having a checklist that we can check off. I read my Bible today, check. I prayed today, check. I was generous to somebody today, check. I confess my sins today, check. And to see that discipline or treat it as an end in itself, and that's not helpful. Another thing that uh, is unhelpful is negating the possibilities of, of, of the potential of these disciplines by making them at the very lowest uh, level possible. For instance, if fasting, if you wanna fast, it's to say, well, 
I'll choose not to eat sauerkraut for my fast. But the thing is, I hate sauerkraut anyhow. So it makes no uh, difference to actually deny myself that because it's something I don't do anyhow. And so not to reduce the discipline or the practice to the point where it really doesn't become helpful or useful. A third unhelpful way to look at spiritual disciplines is to actually then to turn the tables and to have expectations or demands on the discipline that are never intended. And what I mean by that is to treat the practice as a cause and effect. If I do this, then God is obligated to do what I want as a result. That doesn't work either. And you can read the book of Job for uh, some examples in that regard. These disciplines are not cause and effects. What a discipline is, is it, again, it opens space. It gives us a positioning before God for him to work in our lives. And so the discipline, the doing of the spiritual discipline is not the goal. The goal is not to complete X number of chapters each day in the Bible. Because if we do that, that's just a performance goal. And so the purpose of spiritual practices or disciplines, again, are to be pathways to a greater goal. And so the benefit of the discipline is not the fact that we've completed it, but the fact that it helps us to deepen our relationship with God in the process of the practice. Oftentimes, when I uh, come home from a uh, run in the morning, Jan will ask me, well, how did it go? And my response is virtually always connected to the time it took me to do that run. If it was good, if, I, if the time I was happy with the time, then I would say that it went well. If the time was slower than I would want, I would say it didn't go so well. Well, her response was, why do you focus on the time? Why don't you just enjoy doing the running? And sometimes I think that is when we get off the track with spiritual disciplines, is we focus too much on the actual discipline and not on seeing it as a process that leads us to something greater. And that's our relationship with the Lord. And so our, our focus is not to be on completing it in order to check it off as an end in its, itself. Because God is not looking for our successful completing a checklist. He wants the process that we engage in to enhance relationship because he's not impressed with merely outward performance. We read this as a clear example in, uh, in chapter 1 in Isaiah. It says this, beginning in chapter 10. In the passages in Isaiah chapter 1, it says this, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. And again, what he's, he's, he's not writing to Sodom, but he's saying that the people of Israel are acting like Sodom. Listen to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of feed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or the lambs or of goats. And again, these are all things that were required for sacrifice that God laid out in Leviticus. And now he's saying he's had enough of them. He goes on to say this. When you come to appear before me, who asks this from your hand? Trample my courts no more. Bringing offerings is futile. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and, and calling of convocation. I cannot endure solemn assemblies with iniquity. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you stretch out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourself clean. Remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. 
And so God is not impressed by outward practice or performance because his real interest is the heart. Hosea says this, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And so the danger is turning a practice into an end in itself when its intent is to be a means to an end. And that end is to know and experience God and have greater depth of relationship with him. Paul praised this in Colossians 2. He says, I want their hearts to be encouraged and united in love so that they may have all the riches of assured understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's the goal. Any practice, any discipline that we do is to simply to position ourselves in a way that we can experience Christ himself and gain understanding and experience of the riches and the knowledge of understanding. And so spiritual disciplines or practices, again, open space. They position us to be able to receive. They're not to be a mechanical formula to get God to do what we want him to do, but they simply are the pathways that we travel on, which gives God access to our lives. And it gives him permission then to do what he wants in our lives. And what he wants is to heal us, to make us whole people. So spiritual practices and disciplines are proven ways in which people have encountered God. And so we engage them, we offer them to God for him to use how he chooses, when he chooses in our lives. They are just helpful tools for spiritual growing. And so the discipline is not the goal, but it opens space to get to the goal. A couple years ago, I found an app, and uh, the app is called Lose It. And it uh, helps people to, uh, to lose weight. And at that time, I, I wanted to lose some weight. And basically what you simply do is put in what you currently weigh, what you hope to weigh after you're done, and then the, the app just calculates the number of calories each day that you can have, and then they slowly reduce those until you get to your ideal weight or the weight that you're shooting for. And the thing is, I followed the app, and it was helpful, but the app itself didn't cause me to lose weight. The app only gave me the, a pathway to follow, that if I followed, in fact, I could lose some weight. And so it took a little over a year, but I lost 45 pounds using it. And that's the beauty, I believe, of spiritual disciplines. Just the discipline itself, practicing it, isn't going to get you there. But by practicing it with the focus that it opens space for me to encounter God, that is what God is after, and that's what spiritual disciplines are for. The five spiritual disciplines associated with Lent are fasting, prayer, Bible reading, almsgiving or generosity, and confession. And next week I'll talk a little bit more about some practical ways that we can practice those things. But for now, I'd like you to consider. Consider taking Lent as an opportunity for an intentional process in which we can be followers of Jesus, that we can put ourselves in a position that we can begin to allow God to transform us, to reconfigure our mind, our neural pathways, in order that we can live as God has desired and designed us. So I invite you to take a Lenten journey. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you for the richness and the experience of your church over centuries, over 2,000 years, and practices that uh, 
have been established and used that uh, help us to know you and to grow. But I thank you most of all that your desire is, for, is to transform us. And you're working at that and you're doing it. And you're simply asking us to participate. And so may we do that. May we do it and may we, we see and experience the fruit of obediently following you and walking in your ways and deepening our relationship with you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Just an announcement, uh, youth group was relaunched again this past week, uh, Wednesday night for the uh, junior hires and middle schoolers, uh, Thursday night for the high schoolers. Please come out uh, uh, and be part of that, especially in this time of, uh, of restrictions. It's an opportunity that we can be face-to-face and to enjoy the uh, interaction, fellowship of, uh, of others and our friends. So just remember that. And again, Sarah's looking for some uh, volunteers to help along the way. And if you can do that, please contact her. And now, may the peace of Christ that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And may God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you now and forever. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Have a great week and I invite you to enjoy this final song. Yeah.